Good afternoon, everyone. Ladies, yes, gentlemen. I'm uh, very glad that you're here, staying behind to the last minute, especially in a room of such a peculiar layout. I'll do my best when I have to point at some things as slides. I'll say I'll do my best. Anyway, my name is Paweł Moll. Um, in case you were wondering, I'm Polish. Although I uh, live and work in UK, in Cambridge, and I work for a company that you may have heard about, God's Arm. And uh, I'd like to talk to you about a feature of uh, compilers that is there, as we'll see, for many, many years, and is not widely known and, and used. It's hidden behind a, obviously, three-letter acronym, FDO or others, as we'll see in a second. And uh, it could be considered a magic option that will make your program run faster. Is it? The presentation will have a very simple and standard agenda. I'll talk about the basis of the problem, uh, give some examples with two particular types of FDO being used, and uh, we'll finish up talking about real-life deployments. So, not to, uh, not to take my time with starting, let's start with terminology. So TLAs, three letter acronyms. I've already used the FDO one, which can be resolved as feedback directed optimization, all but as feedback driven optimization. It is also widely known as PGO, standing for profile guided optimization. And there is a standing joke that if anything that we invent new in the 21st century around computer science has been already done by IBM in the 70s. And indeed, they did do this in the 70s uh, with, within mainframe, and they called it PDF, Profile Directed Feedback. Uh, if you look uh, closely at Sun's documentation, maybe slightly later than the 70s, but still quite a long time ago, you will find something called PFO, Profile Feedback Optimization. It's all the same stuff, at least for to me. Uh, I, unless I uh, see any opposition, I will assume that it's all the same stuff. And what is it about? This technology, let's call it, is supposed to add help compiler to make decisions. Compiler uh, has, a lot of, uh, has a lot of decisions that it has to make during compilation phase. And disclaimer here, I am not a compiler engineer. I'm not a compiler guy. I'm a normal person. I work on the tool side. I got into FDO and, and story rather from the uh, profiling, uh, from the profiling side rather than the co uh, the code generation side. But I still had to learn a bit about compilers, and I'll try to pass my knowledge to you. If we have any uh, compiler engineers in the room, uh, I will not try to compete with you. <coughs> Meaning, don't kill me. So the but first and the obvious decision that the compiler has to do is to answer a question: Is then more probable than else? If you have a very simple if statement with some with condition, a one possible outcome or the other, the compiler will have to make a decision which one to consider more optimal and which one to optimize for. And we will see an example of that one in one of the uh, uh, in one of the further slides. Uh, is a function worth inlining? That's an in incredibly important question these days. The mo most of the uh, compilation tool performance increase these days come from uh, proper function inlining. Uh, I will not show any example of that because this is becoming especially important with huge code bases. And my example is very simple. And uh, the other classic question is, shall I, uh, should I unroll the loop? Uh, unrolling the loop just means instead of generating a single body, a single uh, uh, loop body, generating a number of them in parallel uh, in, serial, uh, in series, trying to uh, resolve a couple of resource conflicts. Uh, we'll see an example of that one la later. Normally, compilers are answering this question using a bunch of quite complicated and uh, pretty much finger-in-the-air heuristics. They will have some code saying that if it is Tuesday and the code looks like this, we'll try to go that way. Uh, obviously, I'm joking a little bit, but not that much. Okay, there is no hard science behind it. There's a lot of guessology behind. And this, this problem is quite old. Uh, even in uh, Fortran, the first optimizing compiler that we have ever heard uh, came from IBM, obviously. Uh, and it was a Fortran compiler. We'll see a, uh, some example from the manual late in the next slide. And uh, there is an interesting fact about it. Uh, Fortran itself, the language defined a frequency statement that can be used within the code for around the conditional statements to give hints to the compiler 
which path is more probable than the other, which path will be us usually taken by your program. And we have we seen the same very similar mechanism in GCC today. There is a one of the built-in function, uh, built-in expect, uh, just pretty much gives takes additional uh, argument uh, that is a hint to the compiler one way or the other. Uh, this function is being used, is hidden behind the macros likely and unlikely that you may have seen in Linux kernel code. If you look at the document, GCC documentation though, just around the built-in expect, you will find a, a sentence and I quote, programmers are notoriously bad at predicting how the programs actually perform. And this is true. We have seen it uh, again even within the Linux kernel a couple of times. So the obvious idea is to solve the problem automatically. To run your program on real data, measure the frequency, branch frequencies, so in case of if, measure how many times then is being taken, how many times else is being executed, and just optimize for the more frequent case. That's an obvious, obvious idea. Obviously IBM th uh, thought about it, maybe not with Fortran, but later on. Uh, interesting fact, uh, Fortran, when uh, doing basic block alignment, so that's more or less what I was talking about. How do you align bits and pieces of, of code generated to make the flow optimal? What they did is, well, I consider it completely bonkers, but probably this was a good idea at the time. They pretty much did a uh, compile time simulation. So out of the all possible space of combinations of all the basic blocks, they're doing Monte Carlo simulation and trying to figure out, well, randomly, which one will be best. Um, as far as I know, no one is doing this today. Probably in 10 years' time, someone will come up with this idea, and it will turn out that IBM thought about it some time ago. Um, this is a uh, screenshot, uh, a, a photography of an original manual for the Fortran automatic coding system. And if you look closely, in the, uh, I'll show, try to show it on both screens, around this area, here, you will find that the problem of compiler taking, making decisions next, this Saturday will be 60 years old. This manual has been, uh, is dated at 15th of October, 1956. And 15th of October, 2016 will be this Saturday. Nothing has changed. I will use a very simple example. Um, I must say that the algorithm that has been chosen in this example uh, has been, I've stolen the idea from AutoFDO uh, guidebook tutorial in GCC documentation, on GCC wiki, although I have implemented it myself, I'm proud to say. Um, well, if you haven't spotted that it's uh, bubble sort yet, it's time to get back to your uh, university classes. Uh, the important thing is that there is a critical operation within this, uh, within this algorithm, there is this if one element is larger than the other one, than the next one, the previous one in this particular case, you swap them. That's the basic of bubble sort. Very simple. So let's, talk, let's get to the, uh, to the meat. Instrumentation-based FDO. This is a classic approach to the profile guide optimization or feedback-driven optimization that is available in both GCC, LVM, and probably most of uh, uh, proprietary compilers. The idea is quite simple. You build your program with a special compilation option in case of uh, GCC will minus F profile generate uh, that will inject extra instrumentation inside your code. We'll see an example of what the instrumentation may look like later on. You run your program, and by the way, my bubble sort just goes over a statically defined list of 30,000 random integers and tries to sort them. The data is constant. It's not randomly generated at the initialization. It's always the same. So I run my program. The profiler, the, the instrumentation inside the code will measure uh, what frequency of the, how, how many times the function, the critical operation has been executed, and will generate information about it in a separate file, per object file, in the, uh, in the running directory. Now you build your code again, this time with uh, minus F profile use, and the compiler will start, will, gen will build the code again, this time taking this information under consideration, the, the, the data captured during real program run under consideration. So let's have a look at the uh, effect of compiling a, uh, my example program with GCC 4.8, quite an ancient one, but there's a reason I've used this one, with minus 03. Uh, a letter of explanation, this is a AH64 ARM 64-bit assembler. Uh, don't worry if you don't speak uh, A64, it's not an issue. Uh, the important thing I want to point out that the, algorithm, the, the code is quite simple. Uh, LDR is load, 
So we, see, we will see two loads. We are loading two elements from memory. Then we have a compare. compare. We compare one against each other. And if uh, less equal, meaning the else case, we don't do anything in else case in, our, in, in this particular code, we're just skipping the, this, the rotation, uh, the rotation um, a moment. I'll do this twice on both screens. We load two elements to registers W0, W5. We compare them. When we have to swap, we are storing it back to memory in different order. You can see that those registers are swapped. And we are setting also the, uh, uh, the dawn uh, flag just to, uh, to show that the while loop has to go again. So I'll repeat it on this side. We are loading two elements from uh, two integers from memory into register W0, W5. We do comparison if we have to swap the elements. So we are executing the uh, if statement uh, body. Uh, we will store those the same elements in different order. W0, W5 are, step, are swapped. That's all, nothing more. And setting the, uh, um, the uh, down flag. Now, what are the expensive operations here? Memory accesses. So obviously we don't want to store. We, want, we don't want to do stores if not necessary. If it's not necessary, if we don't have to swap the uh, uh, the elements, and that's why we skip it with branch and branch itself. Branches are expensive. Okay. Let's. Uh, this is a completely separate discussion. We can chat about it later on. Uh, for the purpose of this uh, experiment, let's uh, let's believe that branches are expensive, even if you have go good hardware preferred, uh, hardware branch prediction units, and so on and so on. Therefore, we want to avoid branches and avoid memory operations if possible. The profile generate build case will generate pretty much the same code in red. As you can see, the red code is exactly the same: load, compare, branch, store, and and move. Now, the green italics code is instrumentation added. As you can see, it's cool. there's quite a lot of it. It has kind of bloated the size of the very, very simple function. Now, the, the beginning and the end, the old blocks, the big blocks of green, italic green code at the end, at the beginning and the end, is kind of run once and forgotten. It's a preparation. In our case, preparation kind of preamble for the, uh, for the profiler and uh, postamble and uh, gathering the data. In our case, it does not matter at all because it's a main function. We just run it once. If you were instrumenting some particularly hot function, you would see the overhead of those extra instructions in your, in your profile. Now, I just wanted to point you at the, the small green areas in the middle. So we will find at x6, so increment, well, pretty much that's increment x6, increment a8, and uh, x8, and incre increment x10. I'll repeat it here. I say it, would be a, it will be hard a bit. We are incrementing, every now and then, we are incrementing x6, x8, and x10. And if you look closely, you will find that the x6, so the first add, is incremented every single time when the if check is being in your source code is being executed. Okay? The x8 is incremented every single time that the store, the swap happens. So when, the, when we enter the, uh, the if, uh, if then uh, block. And the last uh, x10 measures how many times the whole while loop happened. And that's more or less what the instrumentation does. It will just measure how many times each of the basic blocks, or the larger, in case of uh, while, the, the loops have been executed. What the compiler can do with such, uh, with such information? It can do that. As it happens, in this data set that I have, in my example uh, numbers, the swap operation happens less frequently than non-swap. So we have previously, if you remember the original code, we have kind of optimized for the swap case. This compiler made the decision to optimize like the if statement body was always executed. It, reasonable assumption, it didn't know better, so he had to pick one or the other, he picked that one. When I provided it with the, uh, with the, real, with the real data from the, for this data set, it spotted that the store, the, the swap block, is executed less often than the whole uh, if statement. And in this case, if you, if you look closely, you will find that it is optimized for the non-swap condition. So only if, we have to, if the comparison uh, returns greater than, we will branch to the, uh, to the two store instructions that will swap the elements, meaning we are saving the, uh, the expensive branch operation as often as possible in the overall goal of reducing execution time. So let's have a look how did we go. Um, not very well indeed. Um, 
couple of data points here. Time elapsed, it's the wall clock time measured for the, for the program to run. Cycles is pretty much the same, is equivalent, it's the same metric. The profile generations, a uh, profile generation in a quite a simple case. We only have added three add operations that run and then operate on registers, very, very cheap. And some preamble code and post that will be executed once. And we already have 2.3% overhead. Um, for more complicated code, this number can go up. I will have some examples later on. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, uh, the optimized code, so the, the code optimized for the, for the data set, it's not performing particularly well, I would say even worse. Now, there's a good reason for it. Uh, 4.8 GCC, as we mentioned, uh, is a special version. It was the first version of GCC that had support for AR64. It's not doing any optimization whatsoever. It was only generating correct code, nothing more than that. Uh, I can assure you that the next example I'll have will show you in, in noticeable and important improvements. Now, one thing that I want you uh, to point to, to kind of attract your attention to is the last row, is the IPC, uh, instruction per count um, metric. It's kind of my personal interest. I spent last three or four years of my life looking at performance optimization, analysis and optimization. IPC is a very commonly quoted as a kind of proxy for program performance. If you can execute more than one instruction per cycle in, uh, in um, massively powered processors, it's good. So IPC is better, meaning your program is better. So just keep it in mind, 1 point, 40, 1 point well, above 1, 1.45, 1.44. It's good. In this graph, you analyze the profile generator and the profile you separately, right? Yes. So uh, if I want to use the profile, actually, I need to do both. Yes. And that this goal, we'll, we'll talk about it as one. Of, that's mo m the most important kind of issue with instrumentation-based profile. And that's what puts people off. Uh, Make no mistake, the numbers there are both against clean O3. So it's separate overhead of, of uh, profile generation. And then I was hoping to see some impro improvement with the profile use. But yes, you have to do this two, two steps separately. OK? GCC 6.1, even with normal O3, already generates slightly better code. And we'll see it in the numbers. Uh, code, the, the argument's exactly the same. Just instead of having two separate instructions to load two elements from memory, there is a single load pair of instructions doing exactly the same. Nothing has changed. We're loading two elements from, the, uh, from memory, comparing them. If we, have to, uh, if we don't have to swap them, we are branching to kind of else condition that doesn't happen. OK? Nothing has changed. Profile generation, uh, the instrumentation uh, added by the compiler with minus F profile generate hasn't changed much either. Uh, again, you will see a couple of ads here and there. Uh, there is one kind of funny thing about it that attracted my attention. It's really irrelevant, but you can see that there, is only, there are only two add ones instructions because the compiler actually optimized the instrumentation as well. It realized that the for loop will be always executed 29,999 cases. So there's no point of adding one 29,999 29, cases. It's perfectly well, in, it's perfectly good enough to add 29999 once every single time the loop is being executed. So even instrumentation can be optimized. 6.1 is much better than 4.8 4 was. And uh, now we have used the profile. As we could. Where is data fetched from the, end, the RAM of uh, prefetch in the cache of the so this is A57. It's got a data prefetcher. I have carefully chosen the, date, the size of the data set, the 30,000 integers, so it fits in L2. So I don't see some huge delays of the, on the interconnect, unpredictable, but it will, miss, it will always miss L1. Okay? So that's how it has been chosen. That's why we'll see significant differences in a second. So what you can see here is a quite a dramatic change of the, of the, of the generated code. It's loop unrolling. The compiler was told that this loop is pretty hot. It is worth unrolling it. What you will see here is the, the fact that there is loads of load pairs. So it just, it's just doing the, the content of the for body, of the uh, for loop body, number of times one after another. That's point number one. And number two, it has optimized for the non-swap case as well. What you can see in, in, the, in the code is that there is a bunch of load or load pair, compare branch, load, compare branch, and so on and so on. The same on the other side. 
policy load, compare, branch if necessary to swap, load, and so on and so on. The stores are kind of in a separate block of code. It's done both. Unroll the loop and optimize the, the branch frequency. And with this time, with pretty damn good results. The profile, the, the profile generation instrumentation cost, so sorry, O3 itself, clean O3 versus uh, 4.8 on pretty simple code is already over 1% better. There is a difference between 4.8 and 6.1. Profile generation is slightly more expensive, but probably because we have kind of saved the 1%, so it's again 2-3% in a very simple use case. And with the loop unrolling and the uh, branch frequency optimization, we have saved 23% of, of execution time. Uh, have a look at IPC. It's pathetic, it's below one. And the code still runs faster in world time. It's just a kind of, as I say, it's a hobby of mine. I'm just showing that IPC is not always the uh, direct proxy of efficiency of your code. Okay? When we, if anyone wants to uh, have a chat with me later on, I can talk to you about hours. Why this particular, this is the case. Now, if we can get 23% improvement for free, practically, uh, why isn't it used you know, by everyone every day? Because it's not really free. So number one, problem number one with, uh, with FDO, PGO, whatever you call it, is training data set. I have cheated, right? I run my kind of training, the profile generation uh, code, on exactly the same data that will be used in production. Now try doing the same with Firefox. Uh, obviously, you could try to run your profile generation on every single web page available in the world. Uh, well, I wish you good luck with this. But uh, there are certain people who tried and failed. Maybe not try that particular one. But uh, as I'll say later, Firefox in indeed has a support for FDO in the build system. And it's not being used by default. Um, Spec 2006 uh, is a very widely known set of benchmarks, kind of real life, ben uh, real life benchmarks as they market it. Has a special set of training data, carefully selected their training data that are supposed to represent the uh, the uh, code work, the code flow of the uh, of the program that is being used with production data. It, one thing that is important, it has been chosen so that it runs faster. If a full, let's say. Uh, Povre benchmark on, uh, of spe SPEC 2006 can take five minutes to execute. The training data will only take something like 30, 30 seconds. And there is a paper evaluating this particular workload, showing why that workload, this training data, was, is good. Why is it good representation, good equivalent of the production data? You can say that there's a, immediately you can say that there is a, it's a, it's a quite a hard problem if academics kind of touched upon it. I would even say even more. It is very hard problem because that's pretty much the only academia reference that you can find in, around this problem. Meaning it's so hard that even academics don't want to talk about it. This is problem number one. How do you create a representative set of data for your, uh, for your code? It's hard. Number two, prof overhead of the, of the profiling. 16% uh, is quoted across the average spec 2006. Uh, it can go all the way to 100 times, in particularly bad examples. And the last but not least, as you've pointed out, do you have to do the build, your build run twice? It, well, it may not be a problem with my uh, bubble cert, it compiles in no time whatsoever. It's a different story with a build that takes a couple of hours. Um, your uh, QA and, uh, and uh, infrastructure DevOps, as the, these are they are called these days, people may not be particularly happy about having, uh, having blowing their build process twice. And you have to also remember that you have interleave those two build stages with the test run, with the profile generation run, which also adds, adds time and complexity to the build system. Um, it hasn't been used that the FDO is not being used that often. There is a kind of reason why. So let's forward back to about 2008, when the first paper, when a paper authored by a bunch of guys at Google shows up. Uh, feedback directed optimization in GCC with estimated, that's the important word, edge profiles from hardware, even sampling. Again, important um, difference. Flow is very similar, well, kind of. You build your program, but this time, normally, just clean O3, O2, whatever is, uh, whatever is your poison. Sorry? 
I have Second, sorry, just. You combine with the symbols, right? Uh, yes, for a reason. So well spotted, yes. Uh, so the um, minus G, the symbol, the debug, sim debug information will not impact the execution time, but it will impact the the image size. Well spotted. We'll talk about this. Uh, we'll talk about this later. Then you run your program on your training data, whatever it is. Uh, but again, your code itself doesn't have any instrumentation whatsoever. What you do is you perf it. Just normal standard Linux uh, perf record command. You may notice that there's a minus B there. Uh, you know, eagle eyes are, you probably have spotted the minus B there. It's not exactly the completely default perf record session. And we'll get back to this later. Um, then you run additional, and this is important thing. You run a separate tool that will take perf data and generate the profile. It's a separate tool, meaning you can do this separately, offline, somewhere else. You can take the perf data of your system and do it somewhere else. It's a tool uh, created by the Google guys. It's available on, it, it had a number of kind of reincarnations on the way. Uh, currently it's available on, on GitHub. You can find it without any problems. And then, like previously, you build your code again. Uh, this time taking this, the, the, the profile generated by IOTO of the all under consideration. Um, we'll have a couple of kind of, there is a couple of gotchas here and we'll talk about them later. Let's have a look at the uh, okay, let's first talk about the advantages of the sampling profiling first. We'll see the, uh, the results of, of my example in a second. So, number one, if you ever have used perf with default record uh, 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 command line, you've probably noticed that the overhead well, is measurable, but it's nothing like 16% or 100 times. It's manageable. Let me put it like this. It's good enough, as you will see in a second, for Google to run it in their data center. It's kind of, for me, it's a kind of stand, stamp of approval. As I said, profile generation, so the AutoFDO tool, can be run offline. You can run your stuff in your data center if you wish, collect the data, as they do, and generate your profiles later on. No need to generate training, special training data. You can actually run on, because there is no, uh, uh, there is no, um, The overhead is small, so small that you can pretty much do normal, your normal operations. You can run it on your production data. Google data center case, they will just run it in background on every single Google search execution that you do. And obviously, they, in the case of, you could say that they, will, they could also kind of run it for every single web page that someone is watching at currently. Uh, this won't be the all web pages available in the world, but uh, when, it's, when it's Google, there's a pretty good representation of what people want to watch, I would say. And you just run it on the, uh, on the, on the, um, on the real data, on production data. Important thing here is that not only you can do this on production data, but you can aggregate the data. So your Firefox run. You could have at home, run, profile your Firefox every single time you watch, you read some, you watch some website. In Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on and so on, you will aggregate the data, and it should represent pretty much your interests. It should represent the, the profile from the whole week of web browsing. Should tell you that you are most likely looking at CNN.com or whatever else, BBC.com, uh, CO UK, if that's that's what you're from. Then the profile can be aggregated and used on Sunday to generate Firefox for your next week browsing that will be faster. And that's more or less what the idea is. What the idea is, you have a the the guys in, at Google that would they would have a release cycle. They would release their set of uh, search tools every now and then, okay. And every new release will be built using the data collected with the previous release. So you start with nothing. First release of your new. If you started from scratch, your first build will have no instrumentation whatsoever. Well, tough. It won't be perfect, right? Version one is never perfect. Version 2 is also to be uh, removed, and probably version 3 will do something right. But that's the idea. You will build up on, uh, on real-life production code from your, uh, from your previous, um, some, from your previous uh, execution to create a new version of the revision, which will be better. Or not, as we'll see in a second. Oh, we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, no, at the example, I guarantee you, we got some improvement. Not as, well, you'll see. The, Third important thing about the AutoFDO profile, the Google idea, is that the profile is kind of sourced based. Traditionally, uh, the, 
all profiles generated very with by GC, all the instrumented base one will generate their profile linked to an object file. They will just record, say, PC. And then you will have to do some extra work to figure out what, what's going on really there. Now, as you will see in an example later on, this profile is kind of source based. So there is a this function. If there's a function name offset from the first line of your source code in this function. We have we have attributed 14 uh, samples to that particular line. It's like what you see with perf report or annotate. And last but not least, because it's a single run, while well, you don't have the extra training run nor extra build stage, it's much easier to integrate with, uh, with um, uh, sorry, the source profile one. Because it is kind of based on, uh, I forgot about one important thing, because it's source oriented, this profile, it will actually survive some code changes to a certain level. If you have 10,000 functions in your, in your code, uh, you won't change, well, 10,000, probably closer to a million functions in your code. You will not change your, every single one, every single you do release. You will change probably 100. So the information, the profile information will be still uh, valid for the 900,000 plus ones. Well, the pay, one of the paper is evaluating kind of um, the generation of the profile over time if you don't update it. And yes, it goes worse. Right? It, if, you if you start applying the, if you keep a single version of your profile and start applying code changes, the effects will go down. You will see, you will get less improvement from the profiling, but it will be still there. So it's about balancing the number of times you update your profiles, you do your release, your formal release, versus the time you are gathering the data and changing the code. And uh, all this makes it much easier to in integrate with your build systems. That's the effect of uh, auto profile build of my example. Uh, I won't bore you with details. There are two important observations. Number one, loop has been unrolled. Number two, it did not optimize the if else um, condition. You'll see that there is a every all across all around this code you will see a combination of load compare store instructions uh, meaning that the statistical profile by definition it's just a statistical representation of the shape of your uh, of, of execution of your code did not provide enough information detailed enough information to spot the information that the non-swap case is more common than the swap one it may have been kind of for the instrumentation <coughs> for in the in instrumented case you are getting exact numbers because you are counting every single time something is happening here it may have been kind of borderline important something 48 percent versus 52 with statistical profile you are likely and this is the case here not do not you may miss that particular fact uh, numbers are still quite interesting though comparing uh, just uh, just from the the rightmost column on the slide shows the auto, the auto FDO based improvement, minus 14%. Well, if you save 14% of execution time in a Google center, Google data center, I think it, you have just paid for your salary in the next 100 or 200 years. Uh, you probably get a promotion as well, so no, maybe it would be less, slightly less. Um, again, IPC, 0 0.65, miserable. Uh, and it still runs faster than, the, uh, than my 4.8 case. Again, just my hobby. Now, let's talk briefly about the sampling, sampling profile quality, because we've just seen that it did not know, it hasn't noticed the, the, uh, the potential for optimizations of the um, swap non swap condition. There are ways of improving the accuracy. Because what we want, and I've just run the perf record with, default, uh, with the default command line, meaning I'll it will just uh, uh, take a sample every 10,000 ish instructions, okay? Maybe it's 10 milliseconds instructions, but it will just based on any instruction executed. But what we are really want to, to measure is the, uh, the behavior observed to behavior of branches. And uh, CPUs, certain CPUs can provide a PMU, hardware PMU event, triggering only when branch is taken, executed. So in particular, execution one is inter interesting. So if I have chosen, if I've extended the perf record command line uh, asking for branch executed, event, I would have automatically improved the quality of the, of the profile, because I would be focusing on the, and probably reduce the frequency as well, um, sampling rate. Increase sampling rate, reduce the sampling period. So that's one thing that can be done. Uh, the important thing is that has to be, uh, the PMU has to work in a special mode called precise sampling. Uh, Intel has got it under the name PBS. I must admit that ARM 
at ARM. We don't have any real world processors doing anything similar, but uh, you know, keep up to date, things are coming. The second thing, and that's the important thing, that's probably the most important thing about uh, generating profiles for, L, uh, LB, uh, for um, AutoFDO, as you can read in the uh, paper in the call, um, um, titled Taming Hardware Even Samples for Precise and Versatile Feedback Directed Optimization. It's again the same bunch of guys from Google. You can kind of spot a plot here. You can see where, where it's all coming from. The branch history, it's a feature of a processor that will, every single you take a statistical sample, of branch, for example, will also provide you an exact, and that's the important thing, exact history of branches that happened just before that. So although you are still sampling, creating a statistical sample, so you're creating a statistical representation of your program flow, every single time you take a sample, you have an exact and precise information about the short period of your program execution. And that's a killer feature here, right? Again, I must admit when we don't have anything like it at ARM. But, uh, Stay up, to, you know. S stay tuned. Now, the third one, and that's the ultimate solution for the code uh, uh, for obtaining a very accurate information about program execution, is processor trace. And I'm, I can say that both Intel guys and we do have program trace. Um, Linux can do most of it today. If you have learned, if you have watched some of the presentations from. Uh, uh, Tuesday and some of the presentation from Tracing Summit yesterday, you will see that there can be a slight overhead of still, of, if you run it in the classic kind of Linux style uh, case, there can be some overhead of, run, of using the processor trace still. It's something that for many embedded guys from with the past, from uh, um, with the past uh, uh, talking about JTAG debuggers, trace boxes, etc., etc., can be a surprise. Um, one of our friends uh, who is not here measured up. 20% in, in particularly kind of pathological case, granted, he measured 20% of overhead of uh, using Intel PT with perf. So it's not free. You may consider, uh, sorry, processor trace I should probably mention will give you an information about every single, de facto, every single instruction being executed in program flow. Every single one. You will know exactly which branch was taken and not, and you will have full history for the full run, potentially for a price. The price is huge amount of data. Uh, so you may consider you doing this, but only for critical code sections, performance critical code sections. This is a, uh, some numbers, some real world numbers from SPEC 2006, some, sorry, subset of benchmarks from SPEC 2006. The blue bars are uh, improvements claimed in a, yet another Google paper, this time called Hardware Counted Profile Guided Optimization. When they do analysis of training data versus production data on SPEC 2006, worthwhile reading, really, is a good one. Uh, the red one, uh, where the red, the red results are ones measured by, the other way around, red ones are Google paper, the blue ones are mine, obviously you can say for the, from the color of my, of my polo shirt. Um, the differences I kind of ignore. We had completely two different environments. I was running on different version of processors. Uh, this data is pretty old. It's last year. This was before the FDO was up, upstream with GCC, so it was special GCC branch from within Google. When they were doing their paper, they were using different code and so on and so on. What I was trying to answer, is it real? As in, you know, I read the paper, I noticed the 15% improvement on the, uh, on the spec on some of the benchmarks, and that's something that our marketing guys would like to see. Um, they would kill for such an improvement on profiles. I just wanted to see, is it real? And actually it is. You know, the, I was getting pretty good results in certain cases. The ones that are different from Google ones, I just contribute to a measurement error. In general, it works. If you put effort into doing this. Number one, the tools are not exactly major. The AutoFDO tool can uh, break. Uh, if if we have uh, some eagle eyes on the, in the audience, you may have noticed that I have an extra parameter to the auto FDO, call, uh, FDO tool called GCOF version equals one. The tool is generated, the, the profile file will contain a version number and it will have a hard coded version number for whatever the last Google branch was. The mainline GCC, the FSF GCC expect different version and she will just get a uh, GCC complaining that the number is not correct. So I had to force the, the, num the, the version that GCC is, com is, is expecting. Um, and it requires debug, uh, debug symbols. Uh, because the profile, the, the tool itself, will have to resolve the, uh, will have to resolve a PC as sampled by, by perf and uh, match it with the debug symbols in order to generate the source-based profile. 
Uh, that's why the minus G was there. It can be the issue. It can be an issue. But uh, there are ways of dealing with it. We'll see how Google dealt with it. And the last thing is an interesting one. And this also proves, about, proves the kind of non-perfect condition of the whole solution yet. You can have quite a bimodal distribution of, uh, of the improvement of, the, of, of results of your, of, your, of your exercises. It has been observed that, let's say, revision one brought us 10% improvement. Revision two, 3%. Revision 3, 10%. Revision 4, 4%. Revision 5, and so on, and so on, and so on. There is a number of explanations for it, but the one most probable one, and the one that we have observed, is the kind of the fact that running uh, your perf, so generating profile based uh, on an already optimized code, can kind of lose some of the hotspots, can lose some information about what's worth optimizing. And one of the examples is, is given here. A uh, very simple case, if condition, then result takes one value or the other. Uh, it's a very common case. You can even write it as a conditional operation. It can be either implemented with branches, as we saw previously, right? If compare, I mean load, compare, and then branch if one option, and then et cetera, et cetera. Or, and this is common kind of op uh, operation across different architecture. In our case, it's, it's called CCL. Uh, this is a single instruction, not a conditional instruction. It's always executed, and it will do pretty much that. So if condition, then result will be taken from one register or the other. The moment that compiler, and apparently that's the case with libquantum, one of the uh, uh, examples used by Spec 2006, it is a critical operation. So the first time you build your code, the, the FDO will be just read at this branch in, this, in the congenerated code. So the compiler will do the obvious thing and generate a C cell for it. And by the way, there are also good reasons that I don't want to get into why C cell is not generated, right? It's not a obvious answer for everything. But the compiler will immediately spot the fact and generate C cell instead. So next time we run this, the same profile, the branch is not there. None of the, uh, none of the hardware blocks that I've mentioned will spot the, the fact. It will drill into the C cell and tell you, uh, tell you what the C cell did. The information is lost. So next time you build your process, your, your program, well, you're generating branch again, and you're taking the penalty. So an example that has to be kept in mind. Very quickly, I wanted to mention that, uh, I've already mentioned that the FDO is also available in both flavors in LLVM, uh, both as instrumented approach. It just takes different arguments, but the flow is pretty much the same. And auto FDO, again, the flow is slightly different. You can use different tool. You have to, well, you used to have to use different FDO tool that generates LLVM profile, because they used to have completely different pro uh, uh, profile formats. I'm uh, pleased to report that in 3.9, or maybe it will be for zero. Sorry, the 3.8 now can use the same GCOF profile as GCC does, and in 4.0, I think the parameters are also unified. But that's, you know, implementation detail. The basis of, of operation is exactly the same. Um, and this is an example of the uh, text version of a profile generated for LLVM. I've chosen to show this one because it is a kind of human readable text. Uh, this obviously is uh, part of Drystone, uh, everyone's favorite benchmark, at least marketing favorite benchmark. And uh, they would uh, kill more than one person to get a proper improvement on, on Drystone numbers with any compilation you tool. Uh, what you can see here is Top right corner is a just excerpt from the, from the profile. You'll see a function name. Uh, 14 samples have been uh, attributed to a function preamble. Uh, the yellow 5 colon 14 means that the function, the line 5 inside this function, so offset 5, uh, has been attributed 14 samples, and so on and so on. The important thing is that the last line, offset 8, uh, this, from that line, there were some calls to, proc, pro, uh, to uh, other function, proc 7, uh, it has been measured 10 times. One can, f one can wonder why there's this discrepancy between 14 and 10. Uh, the <laughs> answer is quite simple. This data is coming from the PROC function execution. It has been called from that one, so it, this, this, this edge has been generated. The thing is, it's a statistical profile. Therefore, we have sampled PROC 7 less often than PROC 3. Here you can see the, again, example of the statistical nature of the whole thing. But statistically speaking, if you had if proc7 else something else in this line, you still should, theoretically, that's the sampling, base, uh, sampling profiling basis, you should see 
equivalent or representative number of calls for, fun for both functions. Those profiles, I'll just repeat it, are not exact. They are statistically relevant. They should be statistically relevant. If they are, you will still get very relevant information out of it. So now, to finish up, let's talk where is it being used. Oh, I already said that it's not that widely used, after all. Uh, there, it's kind of a public secret that number of uh, commercial products do use FDO. Uh, I know, sorry, I have been told that uh, portions of Windows kernel are built, not only portions, are built with uh, profile gated optimization, the performance critical portions of, of Windows kernel. Um, I already mentioned Firefox and also CPython. They have f support for FDO in the build system. It's just not being used by default, so the packages that you will get from Debian, for example, will not be optimized uh, using FDO. Now, allegedly, uh, our colleagues at Intel contributed kind of FDO static profile to uh, CPython code that all did immediately brings something like 5% improvement on the, on, on the interpreter loop. I haven't found any evidence of it. It may be their custom branch that I just simply didn't find. But it would be, on principle, possible. You could contribute profiles uh, to the source repository and just keep them updated every release that happens. Very similar to what Google is doing in their data center. Um, Google data center are obviously using it. That's the place of birth of auto FDO. They are, as you will see in second years, quite extensively. Uh, and also their friends are at Chrome. Both the browser and the OS are using the uh, auto FDO uh, on production data, which I read as on Chromebooks. They run perfs at, perf in, at customers' Chromebooks and then kind of feed the data back. Uh, it's just my interpretation. Uh, and the last kind of last couple of months, or maybe last year, uh, kind of auto FDO uh, a keyword showed up in Clean Linux. It's Intel's initiative of generating kind of cut down um, distribution for VMs, for virtual machines. And they say that the profiles there are being built using uh, tuned microarchitecturally, so for particularly Haswell, and also built using OTFDO. I couldn't find any evidence, but that's clearly they stated on their website. OTFDO is being used. So the Google guys. AutoFDO, Automatic Feedback Direct Optimization for Warehouse Scale Application. Good paper. I encourage you to read. Uh, the picture is stolen from there. The important observations are, number one, bottom left corner, you will see that the, uh, well, the bottom line, left one, that they run perf everything. They run in their data center. Everything. Data from the perf is then being collected and uh, stored in a, uh, in a sample database. Uh, also, they've got a separate store of debug information. That's what it gets down to. So every single time they build it, they strip the binaries and release the binaries uh, into production, but they keep the, the uh, uh, debug symbols in a separate place to be able to generate the profile that is being generated on aggregated information for, from the last days of execution. And then it's being used to build the source again from the, uh, uh, by the, uh, some compiled into the release binaries. It is pretty complex infrastructure, but as I said, in such a case, in case of a uh, Google's, uh, Google data center or any data center, every percent of, of savings translates into big money. So uh, they're investing into it because they have return on investment and they can afford it obviously as well with their man force. Now, what's the future of it, of the, of the, of the FDO uh, kind of infrastructure? The Google guys are doing pretty damn good job with LVM these days. Well, they pretty much shifting into LLVM direction quite dramatically. And they are keeping LLVM kind of in mind when it comes to FDO. It's not on par in GCC yet, uh, but it will be pretty much soon. Uh, there will be more and more hardware from ARM, from Intel, that will provide data relevant for the use case. So more and more precise information about code execution. And the last thing is that all we're talking here about uh, that is, you know, execution-based optimization and so on and so on, and it has been invented by IBM in 70s, and no one is still using it. It's all fine when it comes to static code compilation, but funnily enough, JITs, the managed environments, whatever you call it, are, are using it, are doing this for a good couple of years. V8, uh, um, OpenJDK. In many of JIT cases, you will find the code that will measure the code that has been just uh, optimized, uh, generated, 
and potentially recompile it with the data captured in runtime. So it's happening anyway. It's just the static code is behind us always. So a friend of mine, when I showed him this title, joked that uh, if traditionally, if a presentation has a question in the title, the answer should be no. And I was very happy to accommodate him and, uh, and to say that no, AutoView is not a magic make my program faster compilation option. Although, if you use it carefully, you know what you're doing and you're ready to invest into it, it will bring, it can bring significant improvements. AutoFDO dramatically re re reduced the, bar the entry barrier dramatically. It's much simpler to use it, so give it a try. Uh, just make sure to measure the results, because as, as you have seen, uh, sometimes you may be surprised. Thank you, and uh, obviously I'm happy to take questions now. I'm, we have a coffee break now, so you know, stop me on the corridor, whatever. Uh, so this, uh, the question is whether something like this, something, uh, optimization like that can be done in, in runtime. Uh, yes and no. The idea is very old. It's called dynamic binary optimization. Uh, it has been successfully deployed in a HP RISC architecture. So the HP RISC guys kind of by definition, they didn't care about static optimization. They were doing everything in, online. Um, and out of this, a tool called Dynamo happened. Uh, it has, but there were people who were trying to deploy the same tool on x86 with miserable uh, results. Uh, there is something good that came out eventually from that experiment. It's called Dynamo Rio, and now it's a dynamic binary instrumentation framework that can be used like Valgrind or PIN if this talks to you. Uh, interestingly enough, because it's got the kind of uh, dynamic binary optimization um, pedigree inside, if you run Spec 2006 under Dynamo Rio, certain benchmarks will record. Normally, you would expect overhead of running of using the DBI tools. Certain benchmarks will actually show some improvement because the way the Dynamo Rio is being gen is, is is executed, it creates a dynamic uh, tracking cache of your program. So it kind of reshuffles blocks of code as it sees fit and creates a optimized version of it on a side and runs that one. So yes, there are some examples. Not that successful, though, on, on x86. And the same applies to ARM, by the way. Uh, I think essential question. What is the status of uh, auto-IDO in upstream Linux? Uh, as far as no, I... In Linux, not, not in Linux, in GCC or uh, So I think when it comes to... Yes, so uh, with GCC, it, it's there, both, as you, as you saw, both instrumentation and the auto-FDO approach. Well, it's, so the, the profile does not, uh, it's not like the events that they support. Profile, once you have used your, your well, profile capturing tool and, the, uh, and your converter tool potentially, uh, you are getting, uh, well, edge frequency information. And that's what compiler wants. It doesn't care about how did you get into, the, into this knowledge. And then there is uh, some process involved uh, to capture that profiling data and then somehow process it so we might be fit to the... Uh, yes. So that's the, uh, if you allow me to scroll back slightly, let me just quickly find the slide. Uh, so well, let's talk about AutoFDO in particular. So uh, uh, here we are. That's the process. Minus B will instruct Perf to include, well, to ask the hardware uh, PMU on x86 to uh, um, include the last branch record, so extra information about the, every single sample into the in the Perf data. But it's not necessary. You may kind of skip the minus B. It's just it just increase, improves the AutoFDO quality so much that I did not want I wanted it to have it in this in the slide. If anyone showed it, used it as a reference, it would be unreasonable to use on x86 at least, because I've mentioned we don't have this on, on ARM. You can still, by the way, one thing I have kind of uh, swim above was the fact that I have just captured the, the profile for AutoFDO on x86 and used it to build uh, my ARM 
code. It's perfectly fine, it works, because it's source-based information. But anyway, yes, so minus b will make sure that perf.data uh, perf has enough information for the create GCOF tool, for the OTFDO tool, to create good frequency, edge frequency information in the profile that is then being fed to GCC. Okay, and so if I want to use uh, processor traces? Uh, in, with, when it uh, comes to Intel PT in particular, uh, the same tool in some newer version, there is an article somewhere on the Google, I can find the link for you if you want me, uh, you will do pretty much the same. Inst just instead of minus minus profile perf data, you will use minus minus trace equals the trace file. And it will do the same stuff. Interestingly enough, these guys have observed no difference whatsoever between using LBR and trace. There was no extra improvement. The LBR with, uh, provides good enough information to, ex to, to extract every single last bit of optimization possible with GCC. it will work as well uh, with the future times important. Today you won't be able, sorry, I had it working on my desk in a very kind of convoluted and hacked way. Can an improvement compared to perf again? Uh, I was doing this on, uh, on drystone and I got 5%. With perf I got, well, zero-ish, uh, so it's not surprising. Uh, but drystone is a very special case. I had to restrict myself to drystone for certain K problems, num namely the size of the data. Uh, when it comes to when the, our friends at Linaro and uh, Matthew was here, I think in this very room on Tuesday, showing the state of course side integration with Linux, and I think the patches for integration with Perf are either 4.9 or are due 4.10. So any day now, you will get the same kind of level of integration with Perf as you get with Intel PT. And then we can start talking about uh, using it in the, in the tool. It will happen. Okay, and the same applies to LVM. So the same data would be there. Because LVM now can take GCOF, so the same format. You don't even have to use the other version of AutoFDO tool, then yes, you will get the same information. Both compilers want the same. They just want edge information. As it turned out, GCOF was doing a better job on describing it than the original LVM profile. So they had no choice but to start taking GCOF as well. Um, if not, I will probably uh, say goodbye to you. And uh, the, open, the closing game is next, or maybe the uh, next after one? Ah, there's a keynote first, and then the game. Do not miss the game. <laughs> For God's sake, do not miss the game. <laughs> if it's your first time at ELC, do not miss the game. The best part. Um, thank you.